right, guys, welcome back to another edition of Raw Intuition Inside Scoop. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing you to a beautiful woman with an amazing weight loss story uh, that is actually approaching 300 pounds now. She started off at 436 pounds, and she is approaching her original goal of 136 pounds. So that is amazing. Her name is Heather Goodwin. And she's here with us tonight to share her story, uh, all the successes, all the learning opportunities, the struggles, and just some inspiration for us all. Uh, whether you're dealing with weight loss or any other issue that requires dedication, persistence, faith, you know, what have you. She stuck with it through the tough times and it got her to where she is today and she's here. She's going to tell us all the details and I'm just very thankful to have Heather with us tonight. So Heather, thank you very much for joining the channel and sharing this amazing story with us. Oh, thank, thank you, you so, so much, Matt. Matt. I'm, I'm so, so excited, excited to be here, here with you. you. Thank you. So we can start with basically a little bit of your background and, uh, you know, what was it that got you to the point where, you know, something clicked, uh, something inspired you to want to change your life and start heading in a healthier direction? Well, one thing that you need to know about me is that I've been fat my whole life. Like I was born at my ideal weight and that's the last time I ever saw it when I was a cute little baby with roll, you know, those little rolls and the chub and then I was a cute toddler, but by the time I got to elementary school, it wasn't cute anymore, and I was just the fattest girl in the school, every class that I ever had, and that was really hard, you know, as far as growing up, and so from about the age of 11, I, I've been on a diet of so some kind, um, trying to, if I was either on a diet or breaking a diet, and, and, and actively binging and stuff, so I um, tried everything from, I did a lot of Richard Simmons deal and meal and <laughs> Weight Watchers and Pops, which is like a, a club called Take Off Pound Sensibly, which is like Weight Watchers. But pretty much I've tried every diet, every pill, every potion. Um, I did Fin Fin. You know, I was willing to risk my life to get weight off. That is how. When I look back at it, I find that so disturbing, but I see people doing similar things with trying ways of um, eating that I don't think are very healthy just to get weight off now, and I can so relate, you know, because I was doing that. And so and every attempt, I lost, I've lost over 100 pounds. This is my third time, you know, taking off more than 100 pounds. So it's not that I wasn't trying all along, but each time what would happen is i would lose weight it would find me again and it would come back and it would bring friends <laughs> and, and so i was in my 200 pounds in my when i was in my 20s and i was in the 300 pounds when i was in my 30s and by the time i got to my 40s i was up over 400 pounds and i was barely living but a wonderful thing happened to me, and that is that I had a friend who was visiting from the Seattle area, and she really wanted to come to a vegan restaurant that we have here in Portland that was an all-raw restaurant. I really wanted to see this friend, and I was, but at the time, I was a, you know, eat fast food three times a day person. Like, I was deeply into a food addiction and just binging constantly and i thought raw food there you know i what am i going to eat there and i was picturing raw bread dough and <laughs> like do they eat raw meat like is it like steak tartar i had no idea so i did some research and i was even more horrified salad it's just salad <laughs> and so i was like okay it's close to this, you know, fast food place. I'll just go there, meet with her, have whatever, and then I'll go, you know, I was planning my binge for afterwards. And so we went to Blossoming Lotus, and I had this raw sampler platter, and I, I, it was, I still remember it. It was like 
raw lasagna and some nachos, some live nachos with, you know, queso dip and um, all kinds of just delicious raw food. And it was so good that I'm, I, instead of binging on the way home, I was in tears because my friend looked so good. She had taken off over 80 pounds eating this way. She was so healthy. She had been so sick. I was so sick. It just gave me so much hope. And I thought, oh my gosh, this food is delicious. Not like delicious for healthy food, but it's just, it's yeah. just really good. <laughs> I totally live on this, you know, I know food and this is good. And so, um, I went home and I researched everything I could possibly find about raw food. And I joined, um, a website called raw food rehab. And that was a great experience. And I was, you know, fully raw, um, for over a year and, uh, it was, it was great. And I took off 140 pounds. Wow. So, yeah. So that was, that was kind of the beginning. And I'm so grateful to that friend because before that, um, you know, in my heart, I knew that I wanted to be a vegan. I had read John Robbins book, diet for a new America way back in college, but my food addiction was so strong and I couldn't break it. Um, that I couldn't do, I couldn't live in integrity. I couldn't like, I love animals. Um, I believe that the vegan diet is, is the ideal diet for, for people. I really believe that you look at our teeth, you look at our intestines, you know, yep. you look at God didn't put us in a slaughterhouse. He put us in a garden. He didn't put us in a milking barn. That's right. <laughs> um, and so I, in it, and, um, so anyway, I had a strong, deep conviction that I wanted to be vegan, but I didn't think that I could do it. And um, that was the ticket that helped me to become vegan. And I'm so grateful to her. That's terrific. So you mentioned that you were sick. Uh, what other issues were you dealing with other than the, just the weight gain? Okay. Well, when you think weight gain, you have to kind of picture that I was only five foot two. Mm. And that's so that's 62 inches tall, right? And I my measurement around my hips and my, um, you know, my belly was 90 inches. So I was a whole yard <laughs> bigger around than I was tall. Mm. And that was having just a horrible effect on my back and my knees and my feet. Mm -hmm. um, to the point where I could only stand for about five minutes at a time. And I was just in constant pain. Walking from my bathroom, from, from my desk at work to the bathroom at work would get me. So my heart was pounding. I would have asthma. I would be huffing and puffing and red faced. Um, and it was scary. And I was afraid I was going to die. I had other, you know, it just was one thing after the other. I had everything from migraines to acne to eczema. So I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't feel I was in so much pain. And internally, I was a mess. I had cholesterol well over 400. Mm -hmm. I had high triglycerides. I was on three different medicines to lower my blood pressure because they were scared that I was going to, you know, have a stroke. Yeah. Uh, but even with all three of those medicines on board, it was still elevated. And I just knew that I was dying and um, I couldn't die. I couldn't die because I had, I was a single mom and I've, I've been, you know, a single mom since my kids were like two and two, wow. two weeks old for my son. And I was helping take care of my parents when my parents were getting sick. So I had all these people that were counting on me. And I knew that I couldn't stop. I couldn't give up. I was, I, um, I just had to find a way to live and to get my health back. Mm. I'm glad you did. And Thank you. Yeah. And what, what do you think it is about the plant-based lifestyle? I know you said you tried all these other things. What's different about the plant-based lifestyle that, that worked and, and it stayed, you know, it, it worked long term. Sure. Well, you know, it's because um, it's because I have so many reasons to be plant based. As I said, I, I deeply feel that it's the ideal human diet. And I've 
had such great health turnarounds. Every single one of those things I told you about, and that was just a small part of the list. <laughs> like I also had sleep apnea, but every single one of those things has turned around. I have zero joint pain. I walk between four and six miles a day now. So I just feel fabulous. The depression lifted, my mood got better. Um, I just, I feel like I've been let out of jail, you know, and so that's part of it. But also I'm an animal lover. So sometimes when I can't do it for myself, I can do it for the animals. Mm -hmm. I, I really believe that this is the best way of living for the environment because animal agriculture is so incredibly destructive and polluting to the environment. And so I can't in good conscience poison the home where we all live and and if you even taking that further when we have when we ruin the climate okay so when we have climate change mm -hmm. that causes things like superstorm sandy and these horrible hurricanes and yeah. such destructive things and and famine and all kinds of disturbances in the weather and so that means that children are going to die and you know so I love having a diet. It's not to make people feel guilty, but I love having a diet where I have clean hands. I have a clean conscience. I'm living in integrity with what I truly believe, which is that all life has value. You know, even animals, even the poor, even the disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. And so the ethics of it are really important to me and that helps keep me on track. And being very frank, I also overcame my my food addiction. I figured out how to manage that and and that has been life changing. That has allowed me to be able to stick with this finally. Wow. And it's been at least three years that I've been doing really well, so I feel like uh, it might stick this time. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, well, great. So basically you're saying, you need to find your why. Is that what I'm hearing? You need Absolutely. To Absolutely. You know, it's, um, I watched my parents very sick with mostly with lifestyle diseases. My dad had MS, but we know that that's very much influenced by a, a heavy animal products diet. Mm -hmm. And my mom had a genetic condition that hurt her kidneys, but because she had heart disease, then she wasn't a candidate for like a kidney transplant. She eventually couldn't even do dialysis because it's too hard on your heart. Mm. And so in a way, you know, her lifestyle diseases contributed to her passing too. And they both went through, forgive my language, but just hell, I don't know how else to say it. I wouldn't wish that kind of suffering on anyone. And I just know that's not what I want for myself. And I don't want, my kids to be stuck being my caregiver, you know, because I didn't take care of myself. That's one big epiphany that I had is that I was so busy taking care of everybody else that you end up trying to give from an empty cup and you can't, you can't, you can't pour out of an empty cup. Yeah. And the, the ultimate act of taking care of your family is really to take care of yourself because if you get sick, who's going to take care of you? And, I know my, my kids are wonderful. They will totally take care of me, but that's not the life I want for them. I want so much more for them. And I want to be running around and chasing my grandkids and having fun. And now that I have this body that works, <laughs> I, I'm ready to go play, you know, yeah. I'm, I want to go have some fun. So yeah. I feel like this is an investment in a, in a happy old age. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your parents. That's, Thank you. Yeah. So how did your family react to to this change in lifestyle, you know, to a plant-based, vegan diet? Were, was there resistance? Were they supportive? How did that how did that all go down? I have the most amazing kids ever because they have been through so many diets with me. And I'm sure at the beginning of the raw food thing, I'm sure they were probably thinking yeah, this will last about three weeks. We just need to get through three weeks and then mom will be back making her, you know, uh, the things we like, you know. So, um, and one thing that did help is my kids were both vegetarian. They were both ethical vegetarians. Um, my daughter decided when she was five that she, I'm never going to eat meat again, she told me. Wow. <laughs> once she 
once she found out that it's that you know the chicken on her plate was like a chicken she made that connection and she was she was like and i'm mad at you for feeding it to me um kids and are so, very interpretive of those sorts of things yes i was so proud of her mm -hmm. you know because like i said i had like she had more integrity than i had <laughs> or whatever and then um my son um I, you know, I, I left the decision up to both of them. So my daughter was vegetarian. I was going ahead and eating vegetarian with her. And then my son was like, well, I like meat, you know? And so he ate meat until he was nine and then he did it also. Um, and it's kind of funny. He was, uh, he bonded with a pig. He oh. became very good friends with a pig Cool. and, and he had that epiphany. And so my kids were already vegetarian. Um, my son is now vegan like I am. And so, they supported me, you know, wholeheartedly in the in the plant based part. So that was great. That was easy, um, and they just saw a change in me. They saw that I was feeling so much better, and that my mood was better, and that um, you know weight was coming off. And so they 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 were very supportive and very sweet. They never did it along with me, but. Um, they were always happy to eat my food if it was yummy. <laughs> sure. Well, being the example, you know, from what I yeah. have found, being the example is the best way to share your message and just to influence other people, right? Absolutely. I have a saying that here's a simple test to see if you can change another person. Mm -hmm. And the test is, can you see that person's reflection when you look in the mirror? Because the only person you can change is yourself. Yeah. And, and thank God for that, honestly, because if you think about it, otherwise, then you're saying, if you're saying, well, my husband or my wife or whoever has to eat like me, and I know that they'd be healthier, and you impose your will on another person, even with great intentions, because you love them and you want them to be healthy and happy like you are but what if they were equally convicted that you should be eating meat or that you should be eating mcdonald's three times a day because you've been in a bad mood ever since you've given up your you know treats or whatever so i don't want someone else to impose their will on me so i'm not going to impose my will on someone else but i will tell you um i do t i do tell people when they ask me they, because they, of course, when you take on off this much weight, oh, did you get gastric bypass? That's yeah. what everybody asks me. Did you have gastric bypass? And I say, no, I went vegan and I started walking. And that, sadly, that usually shuts them down. Oh, well, I could never do that. I can imagine. But, but every once in a while, somebody will go, oh, really? Tell me about that. Because, you know, I've never liked meat anyway. And yeah, and so then they've, um, I've had some really good conversations and helped some people to go plant-based and um, it, now it's super exciting because of you know YouTube and because of my Facebook group. Now I have um, lots of people that we're all doing this together and that just is amazing. Yeah, yeah and I want to talk about your YouTube and, and your Facebook um, but first Speaking of, you know, encountering people out in public, like, you know, that's one of people's biggest worries is, you know, the social pressures, going to restaurants, uh, explaining themselves to people at work. Uh, so what, what have you found um, works and doesn't work in those situations? Okay, so I think that you, it really depends on your personality and how comfortable you are talking about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I used to like today someone offered me cookies at work and she was very sweet. She was trying, you know, she was, I took the, I kept the intention, which is that she was trying to do a loving kind thing for me. Um, and, and because I tend to be kind of a jokester, um, I just handle it with humor. I say, Oh, you know, I'm allergic to cookies. I break out in fat and then they usually laugh and, and that usually shuts it down. I just say, you know, um, but you can always you can always say um, my doctor doesn't want me to have that or I'm not you know I'm allergic to that it's I'm not able to have that because for me it's very true if I have sugar or flour or um, I don't drink alcohol but that's another thing that I would never have um, or processed food or animal food um, 
none of those things, um, I, I feel like all of those are pretty much poison to me. So I'm comfortable saying, you know, oh, I have a food sensitivity. I, I'm not able to have that. And most people, that'll shut them down. Um, especially, you, you can always blame the doctor. Hey, your doctor could be Dr. McDougall, or you could have Dr. Clapper, or Dr. Greger, or Dr. Furman. All of them would back you up if you wanted to say, the doctor says I have to be plant-based. Sure. Um, and so I, I do that. Um, a lot of most of the time, I just bring my own food. Um, you get really good at shopping the menu before you go out to a restaurant, so you know if they have anything for you to have. And I'm not above like asking for, okay, can you please bring me a baked potato and put some salsa on it? And do you guys have any beans back there? Could you put some beans on my potato? And you can end up with something good. Almost everywhere has salad. Um, I know that's not that exciting, but you learn to focus on the experience and the people that you're with. And it's not about the food. For me, it's not about the food anymore. I just um, had my, my son graduated from college and we had a wonderful family meal at an Italian restaurant where there was literally nothing that I eat and that's okay. I ate some, I think it was like some iceberg lettuce salad with uh, that I forgot to tell him no croutons so I was picking the croutons off and I had a squeeze of lemon on it and that's what I had. And uh, luckily, you know, most of the time you get more options. And, oh, and I had two sides of steamed broccoli, so that was very exciting. There you go. But <laughs> now, now you're living the dream. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. But I wasn't there for the food. You know, I was there because I was so proud of my son. I was there to celebrate with my family this huge accomplishment. And so just changing your focus. We're so dang food focused. You know, we have whole festivals around eating bratwurst around, you know, um, all these different cuisines, but it's, it's all about the food. And, um, it really, when you get past that, you just have so much more of life open up for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that is actually another thing that people will, um, give as a reason not to go to a plant-based diet because they think that it's boring or they think that it's restrictive or they're going to miss out on all their favorite goodies. So uh, what was what your experience with this? Is, is it boring? Is it restrictive? Not at all. I Okay, so first of all, there's a, there's a saying that we have that anything you can eat, I can eat vegan, which is true. Yeah. Like I am a boss at emulating like the sad food that I used to like. Yep. Um, and so we, you definitely, if your if your main emphasis is just eating food that tastes good, that's better than a sad, you know, sad is the standard American diet. Probably most people know that. But if you are just trying to eat a better diet, or let's say you're just trying, you're mainly vegan for the animals, and um, or you're just trying to clean up your act. To me, the worst vegan diet, like the unhealthiest vegan diet is better by many levels than the best plant, the best animal-based diet. And the reason I say that is because of the animals, because of the environment, because of um, your own health, you're still going to be better off without all those hormones and um, all the foodborne pathogens and stuff that are in meat and all that cholesterol and everything. So even the like what we call junk vegan food yeah. is echelons better for your health even than than a sad diet. But you can get fat on it, so you have to be careful. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, but um I invite people who think that it's boring or just too healthy or whatever their misconceptions are. Um I invite them to check out any um like a raw potluck or a, a plant-based potluck um, because there's some yummy food there. And just check out some of our wonderful vegan restaurants. Um, you are not deprived. Um, my, I have a good friend who has a, a food blog that's called Mrs. Plant in Texas. Eat some of Mrs. Plant's food because you won't even know it's healthy. It's that good. Um, yeah. So it's, I don't feel deprived at all. 
I do eat a lot differently, and, and especially the way I eat, some people would think it's very restrictive because I don't eat anything that came out of a package. Um, I eat, you know, fruits and vegetables and beans and whole grains and that's, and, you know, potatoes, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes. But um, I enjoy my food because that's another thing that people don't realize is once your taste buds change, they call it neuroadaptation, and people tend to like food that they eat frequently. So if you want to like if you want to like vegetables because they're so good for you, and you don't like vegetables currently, one thing you can do is just choke them down as often as you can, and that will help you to get adapted to the taste, and you will develop a taste for them. It's, it's kind of a miracle. Um, so I love my food. Like I eat a sweet potato, and it tastes like cake to me. Because when you when you're completely off of sugar, um, then you taste the sweetness of fruit. You taste the sweetness of a sweet potato. Or um, bananas are almost too sweet for me now. And so it's just it's it's a miracle. This is from like I had a, a serious Snickers and Twix bar habit. So <laughs> been there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I can say even, you know, so for me, I'm I'm pretty much all raw. I will have mm -hmm. some uh, sweet potatoes and some steamed veggies every once in a while. Um, but yeah, when I, when I think of people just going vegan, you know, just even forget raw, but when you can include the, the beans, the grains, the, the, ve the steamed veggies and all these different things, yeah, you, there's so many options. So it's, it's just, you know, you're a perfect example of it that just because you start, you know, you started raw, but you mm -hmm. expanded your, you know, what you were taking in because, you know, it just gave you more variety and, and how else, I guess, how else did, do you compare being raw and then now that you include some cooked? Yeah, so the things that I include that are cooked, I chose really carefully. So. I still start out every morning, um, and, and this is weird even in the raw community, I think, but I get one of those pound containers of greens, so like 16 ounces. It's the big family one that's like this big, okay, and um, of like spinach or kale or some dark leafy green because I find that really helpful for overcoming um, carb, simple carbohydrate addiction, you know, the sugar and flour addiction. Yeah. And so that really cuts the cravings. And I'll put all my favorite raw veggies on there. So I'm gonna put some bell pepper, some tomatoes, some cucumbers, grated carrots, grated up beets. Um, and then I, I like to use salsa that I make myself as dressing. So then it's a fat-free you know, a, a fat dressing. Um, because I like, I do eat a little bit of overt fats, but I like to eat them in my evening meal. I don't really eat them in the morning. But anyway, so that, I'm still eating a lot of raw food. And then during the day, I do eat steamed vegetables in addition to more raw, you know. But the steamed veggies I have are like carrots. You actually obtain a little bit more beta carotene and some of the, some of the vitamins and things in a cooked carrot, lightly steamed, right? We don't want to destroy all the great yeah. stuff that's in food. Um, and so that's that's what I added back. It was like Brussels sprouts and broccoli, things that I wouldn't eat raw. Mm -hmm. You know, I, tr I tried to eat broccoli raw. You know, you had to chop it up tiny and then it still kind of just doesn't taste. It just tastes awesome when you lightly steam it. And so in order to get more in, mm -hmm. I, um, I decided it was better to have it like slightly imperfect than never eat it because I just didn't like it, didn't like the taste. And now I'm eating just tons of these great cruciferous vegetables and, and sweet potatoes bring a lot to the party. Mm -hmm. um, so does, so do beans, you know, the, one of the things when they study the blue zones, the, the places in the world where people live the longest, yep. one of the things that's correlated with that is their intake of beans. And so, um, and for my particular health conditions, because one of the things I had was diabetes, mm -hmm. um, beans are great at stabilizing your blood sugar. So I found that I had a lot more control and without the insulin spikes, then I didn't have the hunger. 
And then I didn't have the like the overwhelming cravings. And so um, I feel like the, the cooked food that I added, added a huge amount of val value. Okay. And, and I'm still, um, I'm still pro raw food. Um, I definitely, I, it had such a, a healing effect on me. And I feel like even though I'm not, you know, 100% raw now, I feel like it's such a healing diet and I'm so glad that I went through it. I did a 40 day juice feast with green juice, no fruit at all um, on that. And so, and then I didn't have a cold for like five years. Yeah. I'm not even kidding. After I, after I got off my juice feast, um, I just didn't get sick. Everybody around me would get sick and I would start, I would go, Oh, maybe I'm getting a little sniffle and then it would just go away. It would never manifest. <laughs> Um, and I was like, this is so cool, <laughs> except for it's not cool when you're literally the only one at work because yeah. you're the only one who's still healthy. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, I guess, could you go into maybe what some of your struggles were initially and, and how you kind of overcame some of those? Sure. You know, um, with raw food, one of the reasons that I, so I, I, the reason that I stopped I, okay, partly you have to know I was eating what they would call a gourmet raw mm, <laughs> um, yeah. diet. So a really high fat content. I would sit there and eat avocados with the spoon and some salsa. It was great. It yeah. was a party time. And I was eating things like um, cheesecake made out of cashews and dates and um, agave syrup and maple syrup and things like that. So I wouldn't say that I was eating like a healthy raw food. I'm, if I would have been eating a more healthy raw food diet, I probably would have had kept on losing. But I got to a certain point where I wasn't losing anymore. And um, that's when I did figured out that I needed to, to add in to get the same kind of satiation because that's why I was eating all the nuts. Mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling satisfied if I didn't eat the heavy foods. And so I found that I could eat something with a lot lower caloric density, like a sweet potato. <laughs> it's like 300 calories a pound as opposed to like nuts or 4,000 no, nuts oil. Um, but nuts are like 2,800 calories a pound. So they're really, they're super nutritious. They're good for your heart. But if you're a chubster, they're not always your friend. Sure. And so, um, I had to really cut back on the nuts and stuff and I just had to cut the content of the fat in my diet and so that's that's how I was able to do it is with the beans and the sweet potatoes but some of the struggles I had was just like with raw food you, there's so much prep involved mm -hmm. and single mom taking care of the kids taking care of the parents um, and working full-time I didn't have a lot of time and yeah. so it just felt like I was constantly either making food or it even takes a while to eat that much salad you know yep. um and so it, it just seemed like it was time consuming i guess that was the biggest um the biggest hurdle and then you just know that you're wherever you go you're bringing your food with you although at the time in portland there were some raw food restaurants um it was they were expensive and so um yeah it was just learn to bring your food but i think that's a good habit anyway because um now, you know, I don't go to most restaurants just because um, even vegan restaurants use a lot of oil and they use a lot of salt. Yeah. And unless I make it myself, I don't know, you know, exactly what's in it. I do go to some uh, vegan um, potlucks and things where people write out their ingredients of their food. And so you always know what you're getting and stuff like that. And those are wonderful um, I really encourage people to go to those if they get a chance just because you can feel that's one struggle is we can feel kind of isolated. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who lives in Indiana. She literally, she's like, I think I'm the only vegan in Indiana. <laughs> I, can I have a friend in Kentucky. She's like, I think I'm the only vegan in Kentucky, <laughs> but I'm sure there are others. And I, I encourage people make a Facebook group. It doesn't, you know, who knows if anybody will join, but make a Facebook group called vegans and vegetarians in Indiana or something like that and yeah. see if someone joins, you know, yep. that's one way to find each other. Um, and just be persistent about it. Like the, the, the vegan movement in Portland is only big 
because we were all persistent and made noise and said, hey, we want vegan restaurants and we'll we'll patronize them and we'll have meetups and we'll encourage each other. So people can build community. Community um, doesn't just happen. You have to start it. Maybe you have to be the one to start the meetup and get it going, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, as, as you transformed, um, as you started losing more weight or um, – I forget how you, I just saw one of your videos where you don't like to say you're losing weight, you're remo right. removing weight, is that? I like remove yeah. or release. Okay. I'm releasing it, I'm letting it go free. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm letting it free and I'm, um, but you know, in a way that's true because what do you do when you, when you burn fat for fuel, you're, it, it gets transformed into air and you know waste products that you get rid of and yeah. that you expel and so I do think I like to think of it melting away I'm really big on visualization mm -hmm. um, I think and so and I also think of removing it and I like just would like to take it throw it take it <laughs> and like yeah. get rid of it yeah. just get rid of it because um, I don't want it back again and I think that words really matter um, I think it's very important that we're very clear in our thoughts and so I know it's the colloquial expression that you lose weight or whatever, you know, or you put on weight or you, you know, gain sounds like a good thing, but it's not a good thing to me. So, so I choose to say that I'm taking it off, I'm removing it, I'm releasing it, but I don't want to find it again. I like that. So, so as you have been uh, releasing weight, have you noticed any other um, changes mentally um, and or spiritually or anything like that other than just physically? Oh, absolutely. So, um, okay. One thing is that as I, lo I took off weight really rapidly in 2015, I took off 125 pounds in a year. And so that, that happened so fast that my face didn't look like my face to me. <laughs> and I know that sounds really weird, but I have always had a really, really round moon face, like from every baby picture on up. And so I would look in the mirror and it looked like my mom's face. And it was around the time that my mom, you know, had passed. It was like the anniversary of that. I, I look so much like my mom and I would just go like this. <laughs> and it's just crazy, but I would look in the mirror I, I had never like had that visible of eyes and so I was like my eyes look weird uh, I don't know it was just just such a change yeah. um, and um, it, it's hard you get you do get this dysmorphic thing when you change too fast it's almost like your mind can't keep up with it so that was going on and then um, I will you know I kept going I kept struggling I kept going back to the sugar I kept going back to the flour and and um, I had a weak moment in a store this was like September last year I was in a store and they had um, halo on sale for a dollar okay. <laughs> okay so this is this is like a vegan ice cream and it's mm -hmm. really yummy right and I was like, a dollar, is this a misprint? This must not, but it was just a promotion. And so I was like, I cannot pass that up. So I took it home for the kids, <laughs> right? For the kids. Yeah. And then, and you know, I was like, nom, 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 like <laughs> terrible. Um, this is what happened. I'm just saying. And the horrible thing was then it was still on sale. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. then the next day I went back and then I was like, then I said the big lie that we always say to ourselves, well, you already messed up. You're already off your diet, so you might as well go have X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Psychologists call it the, the I'm going to call it, I'm going to clean it up. It's the what the heck effect. So what the heck, I already messed up, so I might as well have, you know, this thing and that thing that I'm craving. And um, that's such a big lie. I just want people to recognize um, one of the things that I try to teach people is to recognize when the saboteur that lives in your head <laughs> um, is telling you things that are not for your highest good. Okay, and so one of the things that it'll tell you is if that it's all or nothing. That if you mess up, then you're no longer on your plan, and you might as well just 
eat whatever. And, and that's, and so now when I get that feeling like, Oh, I messed up, I'm, I'm not, a, you know, perfectly on my plan. I have a mantra that I say to myself right away, next fight healthy. No matter what you have, the next fight will be healthy. And I'll even go and like eat a bite of apple or something, you know, just to say to myself, this is your food. That's poison. This is your food. Next fight healthy. And if you, and instead of saying, well, I might as well have whatever, if you can get yourself to say, if I stop now, I'm going to, I can stop the damage at this point. I haven't messed up that bad. I can still come back from this. Um, and, and that's what I encourage people to do, no matter how bad the slip is. But I was, I found myself stuck. I, you know, that the, the halo incident led to me. This was before I learned what I just said to you. And so, um, I was right back in my addiction. And so it learned, it made me learn to like not take it for granted because I had taken off over 200 pounds by then, you know, like I was really far along the path and still, bam, you know, I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> Woman down. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the addiction. Help, you know, send, send sled dogs or something. But, um, <laughs> It was terrible because I couldn't get back. It was it was almost like when back when I was stuck going to McDonald's even when I didn't want to and I would have to put leave my debit card at home and make sure I didn't have any money with me. I mean, I was that I wasn't I didn't go back to McDonald's because at least I kept the vegan side of it, but I was in the sugar really bad and um to the point where I I was it was like well Right before Christmas was like December, it was November 30th, I know, and I ate like pounds of bad things and I was just feeling sick and disgusted and I literally had this moment where I cried out to God and I'm like, God, I just can't, I need you to take this, I can't carry it anymore, I'm giving it to you, I'm surrendering food this food i am going to not have sugar i'm not going to have flour i'm not going to have processed food and i'm giving it to you and later on i was like oh my gosh what have i done <laughs> because you know i don't know like i said i was over it but like you don't like i take my commitment to god like super seriously so I was like, okay, well, that happened. You did that and stuff. But honestly, what a gift it has been because it just completely took it off the table. It's a zero option for me. I just look at it. I'm like, oh, you gave that to God. You can't help. You know, okay. That's, that's just not an option anymore. And I know people might, that might think that sounds crazy or fanatical, but I'm just telling you, I, it let me access power in me that I didn't have before by surrendering that it's like by giving that away I gained so much more self-control and I'm really proud of myself I haven't had any kind of slip since December 1st of last year awesome uh, yeah and and I I just I just give give the glory <laughs> of him because it, it I don't I don't feel like it's that I'm on my own and I'm doing it alone yeah that's great. Um, and, and that again goes, you know, to show whether it's, you know, to God or if it's for another reason, it goes back to finding why, you know, yes. why do you want to be healthy and, and what is uh, this option that you know is not optimal? What is that going to make you feel like, you know, why do you want to avoid that? You know, why do you want to be healthy? So. Yeah. And why do you want to? Most of us have done so much work to get this weight off. And then, you know, like this has been three long years of my life of just like every day, consistent effort. Um, and really 10 years and really my whole life. <laughs> so, but like it's this, this 300 pounds has come off really over the course of about three years and, um, sometimes more than once, you know, like, when, when I was, was in that binge last year, I actually put back on 60 pounds, but I'm super proud of myself because I've taken off like 89 pounds this year. Mm, wow. So since January 1st, so everything's going really well in seven months. 
Um, yeah, why would you? That's one of the things when people tell me, oh, I was so tempted by, I'm so tempted by this thing, Heather, because I do some coaching and I help some people, and they're like, I had to carry the sheet cake. And, and it was, uh, it was horrible. And I was like, okay, first of all, you're allowed to say no, no, I will not carry your sheet cake. You know what I mean? It's like, so you wouldn't say, um, oh, you're an alcoholic. Would you mind carrying this case of Jack Daniels into the party? You know, you wouldn't do that to people. Like people underestimate our, um, our illness, that it really is as serious as, as other people's and that we really do deserve consideration. But I think a lot of it is some of us have what they call like a disease to please. That's what, um, Oprah calls it. And, and it was certainly true of me. Like, you know, Oh, don't mind me. I'll always come last. Like I know I should go for a walk or I should take the time to make myself healthy food or do whatever, but I need to, I need to do these other things for these other people or, um, so, so, oh, you made that, that cake, cake just for me. me. Well, well, I've been doing, doing really good on my diet, and I know I shouldn't do it, but I'm, I can't say no. It'll hurt her feelings, or, you know, they have that kind of feeling. But it's okay to say no, and it's okay to it, just work out some strategy for yourself. Just say, oh, that looks delicious. Can I take it home with me? I just, oh, darn it. I wish I wouldn't have just had lunch. I'm so stuffed I can't eat another bite, but I'd love to take it home with me. And then give it to a homeless person or give it, you know, yeah. be creative. Um, find another way to deal with it. But you don't, you have the absolute right to take care of your body temple. It's where you live, you know. Um, you have the absolute right to say no to things that aren't for your highest good. And every time you say no to something that's not for your highest good, you say yes to your life, to more life, to more love, to more self-respect. I, I wish, wish I could bottle up how good this feels and give it to my old self, self you know, and like, yeah. see, hey, look, this, this is what's going to happen, and you're going to wear a size medium, and it's, you're going to cry in the dressing room, and they're going to be really worried about you. <laughs> so, um, I wish I could, I wish I could bottle that up and give it to everybody, and um, I just, I find myself, I have so much compassion for people that are still suffering with obesity and they just feel hopeless they feel like yeah sure she can do it but I can't do it I've tried I failed I might as well just you know bury my face in this Domino's pizza and um I was there and I'm here and it's very possible and I'm telling you nobody loved junk food more than I did like I would have been a rack of ribs in one hand and a pint of hog and in the other. I mean, so if a person who is so extremely addicted can get off of it, I promise a normal person can get off of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no, there's so many ways I want to take this, but um, I'm big on self love. Yes. And and when kind of like you want to, you want to bottle up that feeling and give it to your old self, you know, when you start to ask yourself, you know, is what I'm doing self love? Am I, you know, so many people are dealing with depression and other just toxic thinking. Um, they, they, they don't just don't even know what self love is. So, right. um, what sort of, turnarounds mentally you know were you dealing with depression and all all that stuff too and and how was that transition out of that so i am by nature a very upbeat positive person but at that point in my life like my, that was my low point of my life the I, I was in so much pain, so much physical pain, that it was really affecting me um, and just bringing me down. And I didn't realize, honestly, until I came out of it, that it did make me a cranky mom, that it did make me, like, complain all the time about, oh, my back hurts, my feet hurt, my knees hurt. I mean, it was true. I was in pain, and I was asking for love and for sympathy, which is an okay thing to do, but... Can you imagine being around someone like that? Like it was unbearable, probably. So thank you, my beautiful children, for <laughs> um, putting up with me. And um, 
so yes, I think that one thing that we as moms do, like I said, we put ourselves on the bottom of the list. And one way to give yourself self love or to to um, start to cultivate that, first of all, um, look in the mirror and say, you know, I love and approve of you. I love and approve of myself. I know that sounds so cheesy, but if nothing else, when you look in the mirror and you say, I love you and accept you exactly how you are and you are worthy, you are worthy of being loved, it's going to bring up chatter in your mind and you might be like, no, you're, I can't believe it, you're disgusting, you're like, you know, or whatever. You might have those negative thoughts. It's good to identify those thoughts because you can't cure what you're not aware of. Right. So if you're having these recurring thoughts that aren't serving you, get them out, let them come out and just keep telling yourself that you love yourself. Um, and every time you look in the mirror, you know, it sounds so cheesy, but I did, I did that because for a long time, I just didn't feel worthy at all. Um, and I just, I really just wanted to disappear. And it's ironic when you're that big, it's very hard to disappear. <laughs> and so, um, it was, that was very sad. And the other thing is, Find other ways to comfort yourself, you know, like I used to, when I would get very upset, I, my automatic thing was to go find something sweet, make my life sweeter. I, I really think that there's something there. Um, but what I would do, what I do now, my go-to is I go for a walk. You know, if I'm really upset, I'm like, I just got to go for a walk. I got to get out of here. Um, that's, that's my new like go to thing and so finding other ways to build that dopamine because some of it is a brain thing um you know a lot of it is biological biochemical and i want to tell people if you can get that junk out of your system if you can get sugar and flour and processed food out of your system you are going to be able to resist it so much better because so much of the problem is biochemical so Again, I hope that gives people some hope. Like if you can walk white knuckle through three days of being off of sugar and being off of junk, you're going to be able to stay off it a lot more easily. And the same thing with animal products. If a person's still having animal products, we definitely can become addicted, I believe, to that kind of stuff too because it's full of hormones. It's full of you know, adrenaline and cortisol and all kinds of things. And your body can get accustomed to having that and miss it when it's gone, you know? And so, but if you can just get off it for a little while, it gets, you know, even your cheese. I know you don't believe me about the cheese and the ice cream, but if you can get past them yeah. for a few days, you're going to lose that craving and it's going to feel good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I believe that love and only love is the answer. And one of the things I did was, um, you know, I'm a good mom and I do have good self-esteem around being a good mom. And so I thought, what if I treated myself as well as I would my child, like a beloved child? And so if you're not used to being good to yourself, think of it that way, like, I make sure my kids ate their vegetables when they were little, you know, I made sure they got enough sleep. And now I make sure I eat my vegetables and I make sure that I get enough sleep and I make sure that I have some fun and I don't just go to work and then come home and clean and, <laughs> and never have any fun. You know, I would never make a kid do that. Go to school, do your homework, clean the house and go to bed, you know? Right. Um, so, if you can think of it that way, you know, um, treat yourself the way you would treat a beloved child, buy yourself um, things that make you happy that are inexpensive, but just little things like I really little things. I really like the color purple. I got a purple pen and I write all my notes and everything in purple at work and um, I correct, I'm a, I'm a teacher, so I'm a trainer. I correct papers in purple instead of red. And I think my I think my students like it better too because nobody likes to see red all over their paper. <laughs> but it's it's just a little thing, but it's just yeah. fun, you know. And it's it's all self love. It's all you know. I am worthy of making my my body out of the very best stuff on earth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So 
Leafy greens have the highest nutrient content. Dr. Furman, who's a plant-based doctor, rates them at a thousand on this scale called the Andy scale, which mm -hmm. is like the relative nutrition score for different foods. Yep. So your spinach and your kale, those are a thousand, whereas a Coca-Cola, that's a one. <laughs> so yeah. if you can think like the difference between those two items, yeah. um, act actively building you out of something awesome and good for you, mm -hmm. you deserve to build your body out of the very finest ingredients. And remember, whatever body you have, you're gonna have an entirely new one in seven years. That's right. You know, everything, like your taste buds regenerate every three days or something like that and the inside of your eye in every couple weeks and down to you have all new skin and organs and everything and so I want to build since I know I'm building my body that I'm gonna have you know over the next seven years I want to build it out of the best stuff ever because I want to be I want to vibrate at that high frequency and be the loving kind person you know made out of the best stuff so <laughs> yeah. yeah and once you feel that level of vibrancy it's impossible i mean it's very difficult to go back to feeling yes. the way that you used to at least in my experience oh my gosh and so when i was on that binge last year the thing that i noticed the most was i would say over and over like it was almost like i was just stuck in a trap you know the stuck in the pleasure trap but I would say, this doesn't even taste good, or I feel terrible, you know, <laughs> or oh my gosh, my all my things are coming back, you know, like yeah. my joint pain came back right away. Mm -hmm. I got a very pronounced limp. I had to go back to, even though I weighed, you know, 200 pounds less, I had to go back to using my arm crutches that I had to, it's like, was that bad? So just remember, if you ever do go back, the consequences are swift and strong yeah. and and so so not worth it and i really like like if you are a food addict like me and not everybody is i'm not saying that every and rarely do i find somebody that was as bad off as me you know like it tried food tried to kill me like it was it was a bad boyfriend we had to break up you yeah. know <laughs> um it was my lover but you know it wasn't it wasn't good for me yeah. um you know, but seriously, it was there. You do go through like a mourning period. I'm halfway joking, but you go through a mourning period because sure. it was my sole coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. So if I was happy, woohoo, break out the celebration food. If I was sad, oh no, better get a pint of something cold and creamy, you know, yeah. and some chocolate chip cookie dough and um, pizza. It's Friday night with yay, we made it to the weekend. It's it just everything was food. Whatever the question, the answer was food. And so I had to come up with a lot more answers to like appropriate things. Now I, I cry when I'm sad and <laughs> when I'm happy, I call a friend and tell them the great thing that happened. And when I'm bored, I'll go for a walk and think about what I'm grateful for. So it's such a different, or when I, you know, when you're depressed, think about everything that you can be happy about, everything good in your life. And yeah. um, so it's just finding life on life's terms instead of food, 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 food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about uh, gratitude and, and what your views are on gratitude and, and how you've implemented it into your health journey? Absolutely. So there's actually a lot of research. There's a branch of psychology that's called positive psychology, which is kind of like the psychology of what makes people happy and fulfilled and also what takes away our happiness. So one thing that takes away our happiness is a long commute. Yeah. They found that that was one of the things that makes people the most unhappy is having a long commute. Mm -hmm. So just think about that when you're looking at a job. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it makes you more unhappy than making more money makes you happier if that makes sense like oh. they don't outweigh each other so hmm. anyway so one of the things that makes people really happy is a gratitude practice and I have one that just goes like this every morning um, I like to do it in the morning because I think it sets the tone for the day but I think of at least three things that I'm that I'm grateful for and one thing that you're that's important is that you um, think of th three unique things. So each day, 
you have to come up with three more things, okay? And the reason that that's important is otherwise you would be like, my family, my friends, my pets every single day, or <laughs> my house, my job, my friend, you know? Yeah. So you want to, um, every day I, I, it sets your mind frame so much differently because you're thinking, I'm going to write in my gratitude journal soon. I have to think of what I'm grateful for. What am I grateful for? And just the very act of asking yourself, what am I grateful for? What's good in my life? What wonderful thing happened today? It really shifts your attitude so that you're looking for the positive. You're seeing the world through the lens of what's going right instead of this is so wrong and I have this problem and oh, how am I going to do that? Instead, it's like this is going well. How can I go get more of that? Mm -hmm. This um, this thing that I thought was going to happen never happened, you know, Um Sometimes my gratitude um, journal just says, thank you, God, that th uh, this is going to be okay. Like, it's just a statement of faith. Yeah. <laughs> like, like it might not look great right now, but I have faith that you're taking care of it, and there you go. Um, and, and I think that that's okay, too, you know, because even in the midst of big problems, I, I, I know that it's going to be okay and have faith in that. Um, so it's just changed everything. And they've found that people who have a gratitude practice, I wish I had my paper with me because it's really shocking. Like they were significantly happier than their peers, even when you corrected for how much money they make or if they were going through hard things like losing a job or getting a divorce or things like that. If they could keep a gratitude practice up and find something to be grateful for, they were significantly happier, but they also lived longer, made more money or more productive, um, had, you know, better social lives, had just, it was just overwhelming the difference in your life that it can make just by focusing on what you want to expand. So, you know, I would they say what you resist persists. So the more you focus on, oh, these are the problems in my life, those things are going to persist because you're going to put all your energy and all your focus on them. Mm -hmm. And if instead you think what is going right, what is beautiful, what am I grateful for, what um, good thing do I have to look forward to, if you keep your mind on that, then that's what's going to expand and that's what you're going to see, yeah. you know. I heard of a thing where if I say, okay, look around your room really quick and tell me everything you see that is red. So you look around, see if I can see some red. Okay, some red things in here. And then I say, okay, do you, did you focus on all the red things? And you say yes. And then I say, okay, what was yellow? You're like, I have no idea. What was yellow? I was looking for red, right? Yeah. It's the same kind of thing. If you're looking for good, you're going to find it. And whatever you focus on is what you're going to get more of. So you should really focus on the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm big on small steps. And so what I hear you saying is That's... even, you know, your a gratitude list wouldn't, you know, you don't have to come up with complicated or big, you know, things all the time. It can be just simple things, right? So. Uh... Yeah. And it just, you know, um, it has been like, um, I got a really good night's sleep last night. It was such a good night's sleep, you know, but yeah. you know how you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I feel great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it can be something as simple as that. It can be like this morning, um, I had some organic cherries and they were just so good. Yeah. They were just so good. And I was like, this is like better than candy. And <laughs> so I'm like, I got to remember that one for my list. And that's the neat thing is anytime anything good happens to you, you think I got to remember that for my list. And so you're telling your brain, remember this, bring this back more of this, please. You know? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so uh, I want to kind of get into exercise a little bit. And yeah. uh, so what role did exercise play versus diet and, and how did you kind of combine those things to get to where you are? So I knew that I was getting so immobile that I was becoming like a prisoner in my own body that like I told you I was having a lot of difficulty and I was in a lot of pain whenever I would try to walk and so one thing I did was I got a dog <laughs> which you can probably hear barking but um, 
I call her my furry personal trainer because, again, I knew I had that part of my personality where I would do more for someone else than I would do for myself because I didn't have the self-esteem at the time. And so I um, I would take her, at the time we had a dog named Hazel, and I would take her, and when I very first started, I would go to a certain park that had like a quarter mile circle and along the quarter mile there were benches and at first all I could do was walk from bench and sit down for a couple minutes to the next bench to the next bench and I would do that two or three times and that and that was what I could do and then after a while I could walk you know with the whole thing without without sitting down and that was huge to me or only sitting down once you know I would make it little incremental things so even somebody who was as bad off as me you can find a way to make it work um and when so i always um i was walking right from the start i um don't believe that people really should that it benefits you that much to do like um hardcore boot camp type lots of heavy um cardio and stuff if you're not used to that like you should first hardwire the food I feel really strongly about that. You've got to get the food right and put all your effort and all your willpower into staying on the food plan. But I do think that walking is really beneficial for lots of reasons, giving you the dopamine, giving you time to work out your problems that you used to eat over. You know, I have some of my best, like, thinking while I'm going on my walks and things like that. Now that I have taken off, you know, so much weight, I want to move. I feel good. I love to dance. I love to walk. I love, I walk like four to six. I used to walk, you know, 40 feet and now I walk four to six miles. Um, and, um, I have a new pers furry personal trainer, you know, and, and I probably will always have a dog because I always want to keep, you know, that walking. Um, but even I started running. I, I was like, I cannot believe this. Because I, I said, I used to say, if I'm running, you should run too, because there's definitely something chasing us. You know, because I would not have run. Like, I was like, I would just look at those people and go, nope. You know, my dad was a runner. My dad would run this big race in Spokane where I grew up called Bloom's Day, and it's like this eight mile race. And I just was like, he's crazy. I don't. <laughs> I don't, I didn't, I didn't get it at all. And now I'm like, I get it. I love it. You know, I don't, I don't love it, love it, but I totally get it why people do it. And it's, um, it's just amazing. Um, but it, again, you can't out train. Let's get straight here. You can't out train a bad diet. So if you're eating junk food and then training for a marathon, you're still probably not going to, uh, I know people that are overweight that were, that are like, running 13 mile races and stuff like that because they don't quite have the food down yet yeah yeah I, I can't stand you know it's just so disheartening when I see someone that is that thinks that they can eat junk food but they exercise and they just assume that they can burn it off and everything will be okay but you know oh. yeah I, I, I just want to tell them about my dad because let's let's talk about my dad my dad was the physical director of the YMCA so talk about like a jock, right? Yeah, yeah. He went he went to the Olympic trials in two different sports, which was ski jumping and gymnastics. He was a really good, uh, and he was he was a really good athlete, and he was six foot two and one hundred and sixty pounds, very muscular, model figure, right? So, but the here's the thing: the man really enjoyed steak and baked potato with butter and sour cream and ice cream and hostess junk and all this stuff and like i said he was a runner and physically he looked fit you would look at him and you'd say that guy's in great shape he's got washboard abs and the whole thing but the problem was that fat goes somewhere your body is never looking away it has to go somewhere and in my dad he got arterial sclerosis, which is when you get plaques on the inside of your arteries and it hardens your arteries. In his old age, his his feet actually turned purple because they weren't getting any um, 
any blood supply. He got vascular dementia, which is similar to Alzheimer's, but it's from having fat build up in the arteries of your brain. So, you know, you can be covered in fat on the outside of your body like I was, or you could have that plaque still going all inside your arteries. And in my dad's case, it also contributed to multiple sclerosis and he lost his mobility and he had a really horrible um, illness. And so I just want to, I just think my dad is a good cautionary tale because if you looked at him and you looked at me, you wouldn't think that we were both having, you know, fat in our arteries. You might, you, you would know that I was, but you wouldn't have suspected it with my, with my dad until it was too late to turn it around. So even skinny people can have high cholesterol, even thin, attractive people can have heart disease. And I know that they did autopsies on, um, unfortunately, even like young men as young as 18 and 19 coming home from Vietnam. And these are soldiers, right? They're physically training every day, doing push-ups, sit-ups, your typical boot camp, running, carrying heavy packs, doing all these physical things. When they did autopsies on these young men, they found that they already had the beginning of arterial sclerosis and the first beginnings of heart disease, even that young. So, you know, it may not show up for 40 years, but it's happening. And don't ever think that you're tricking Mother Nature, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. It's great, uh, great awareness and uh, lesson for, for a lot of people. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And, you know, the other side of that is that it's never too late to, or too early to start, you know? Mm. If you're a young person, if you're somebody who's young in your 20s that's watching this or because I know like a lot of our raw food friends tend to be on the young side and, yep. and stuff like that and it's never too early to start having that A plus diet and just think about what your old age is going to be like you know like that's amazing and then people like me that are so far gone look at what I've been able to reverse. I mean, I feel like a straight up miracle. It's, um, I am no longer diabetic. I'm no longer hypertensive. I'm no longer high cholesterol, none of that stuff. And my joints feel great. And I jump out of bed and go, woo, you know, so, <laughs> um, it's, you're never too far gone. It's never too late. You, the only time it's late, it's too late is when you're looking up at the dirt instead of looking down at it. So take it to do it today because people love you. People count on you. You know, who, who would be devastated if you weren't here and, and how would they get along without you? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this, you, you kind of just, just answered it, but what advice, would you give to somebody, you know, f from your experience of being overweight in uh, this society that's so, you know, photoshopped and, and everybody's so skinny obsessed and, you know, some people are just plain old nasty to others yep. that are struggling, that are overweight. Um, so people like that, that, uh, you know, almost feel as if there's no hope and they're, they're ready to give up. What what encouragement or advice can you give them for, for that? Well, I want to say, first of all, that it's absolutely never too late. You can definitely, you can always make a change. And whatever tiny changes you can make, they're going to make a huge difference over time. And you might feel like, okay, so when I was so heavy, I was, I thought, okay, I've gotten myself in a hole that I can't get myself out of because no matter how hard I try, it's going to take so long, you know, for me to take off this weight and I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I have the willpower or the ability. And so, but here's the thing. I can eat well today. I can eat very healthfully today. I can get the junk food out of my house. If it's in your house, it's going to be in your mouth. So fill your fridge with healthy, good food. Always be prepared. I, you know, take your food with you. You would laugh, but I have, it looks like a purse, but I have like a box of beans in there. I have some fruit with me, you know. I have a raw potato because I know it's not like the best thing in the world, but I could always microwave a potato if I had to. Yeah. Like, 
always be prepared. Take your food with you, um, especially in the beginning when you're white knuckling through it. Really plan out those first three days and have really delicious vegan food while you're detoxing off of the the stuff you no longer want to have. Because if you try to go from McDonald's to straight salad, that's prop you're pro you're gonna feel sorry for yourself, and it, and it may not take. But if you have some really delicious chili and some, you know, um, some Mexican food and some, I don't know, just I'm thinking of all the stuff I like. But um, uh, if you have some really great um, healthy vegan food on hand and some beautiful fruits and vegetables, your very favorite fruit, all that kind of stuff and plenty of it, then you're going to be like, yay, I can have this back. And a lot of people who have been on things like Atkins and stuff, they haven't had this delicious fruit for so long and they probably miss it so bad. So yeah. just have lots of that. I remember um, that was one of the things I loved the most about when I went raw vegan. I was like, really? I get all the fruit I want. They're like, you got all the fruit you want. You go for it. I'm like, because I really like cherries and berries. And they're like, you have at it. Eat a bush if you want, you know. <laughs> and that's one of the greatest things about raw food. Raw food because you're you're not absorbing like 25% of the calories. So if you take in 100 calories of kale, you know, 25% of it's going to get used up trying to digest the kale and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so you get to eat a large volume and that is a fun thing, especially if you've always been on a diet or they're like, and here is your fruit portion, you know, here is your salad, here is your vegetable. It's like – yeah. That's ridiculous. So enjoy volumes of food because that's one of the awesome things about this diet. Um, I I would be embarrassed to for how much food I eat, but I'm not like I eat that big old salad. I have a friend who's like, it's like man versus food. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care, you know. Yeah. Um, and so that's another thing is. Um, you're right. People are awful. People are absolutely awful, but it's not true uh, about you and you don't have to accept it. And so one of the books that I like a lot that is, is called the, the four agreements um, by um, Don Miguel Ruiz. And he's one of the things is um, it's basically don't worry about what other people think of you or what other people think of you is, is not true. It's, it's only saying something about them. Yeah. So however horrible they might be to you, all they're doing to me is people who people are either giving love or they're asking for love. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, if somebody trolls me on my, on my YouTube channel or, you know, somebody says something mean to me, I just think how sad that that person that they're like, trying to get attention so bad that they have to be mean to someone else. And, yeah. um, and, and I know it's not true about me. So it's like, it, it, the, you know, the, Oh, what he said, that's not actually true. So I'm not going to take it to heart mm -hmm. or the ones that hurt the most is have a grain of truth in it. And the, so, you know, they're like, you're still fat. You should shut up. You're terrible. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, but look where I was but I won't be for long. Yep. But the real me is 122 pounds and you just don't know this about me, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah, just don't accept it. Like there's a famous thing where a monk, um, these, this monk was known for being very serene, right? And he was always in a blissful, serene state. And these boys were like challenging each other. We can get him to get ruffled feathers and they, said horrible things to him and they even threw rocks at him and just were like awful to him and stuff like that. And he never said anything and he just went around and he was always serene. And then one day, I think someone hit a rock that actually hit him in the back of the head or something and he turned around, but he still had the peaceful, serene smile on his face and he talked to the boys and they were so shocked because he had just ignored them for like months on end, right? And so he said to them, if I gave you a gift, who would that gift belong to? And they're like, you're going to give us a gift? You know, they were surprised. Yeah. And so they're like, uh, to us? He says, okay. And if you gave me a gift, who would the gift belong to? You? And he's like, yes. And if you, if I didn't accept the gift, who would that gift then belong to? Well, it would still be mine. 
because you didn't accept it? He says, yes. So people can try to give you the gift of their opinion, but you do not need to accept the gift of their opinion. And so then who does it belong to? All that hate and anger and everything, that doesn't belong to me. That doesn't resonate with me. I come from... I, I come from a place where I want to give love and I want to be compassion in the world and th that's that's what that's not always the person that shows up but that's my intention yeah. and um, I'm gonna keep working at it till I get there <laughs> that's great I really like that story <laughs> um, so I guess we could kind of wrap up with um, what would be like Three tips. If you were going to give somebody three tips on, um, it doesn't necessarily have to just be about weight loss, but about just improving your health, improving your mind, or just whatever, you know, three tips that you would give somebody to start moving in a healthy direction. Well, the first thing I would say is um, that I think that there are really, I can, I call them like the main three components um, of taking off weight because that's what I am in the mode of doing and that's what I've been practicing and been more successful with lately and been working at it for 47 years so I feel like <laughs> an expert. Yeah. And so um, the first thing is work harder on your mind than anything else. It goes mind, then mouth, then movement, okay? They're all important, but you gotta get your mindset right. You gotta find your why. You gotta think about it every day. You have to want it more than you want that food in that moment, and it can be a powerful, you know, uh, stimulant. I would also say that food, that a craving is just a feeling, and feelings pass. So if you think about like the time that you were so angry, you were like incredibly angry and in that moment you can't imagine not just being furious, you know, it just overtakes your body, but you know that time passed and you you didn't feel like that anymore, right? Like that anger passed. Or I remember how sad I was when my mom died, like I was inconsolable. Um, but even that, I, I'm okay today. I can talk about her and I can remember the good things and I'm not in a puddle of tears. And so it's good to remember that. And I'll tell myself that like, I'm like, I want this so bad, but this is a craving. A craving is a feeling and feelings, feelings pass. So just claiming your power in that moment. If I just hang in here, it's going to go away, you know, no matter how strong that is. And then every time you practice self-discipline, it's like a muscle that gets stronger and stronger. So every time you make a good decision, that muscle is going to get stronger. So I say work on your mind. Work on, I, I strongly believe that a lot of people have food addiction, that it's a real thing, mm -hmm. and that they should stay away from sugar and flour if they, if they feel like they have that. And also, I think you can really be addicted to cheese and, you know, things yeah. like that. And so um, just if in doubt, leave it completely out. Just abstinence is your friend. It's so much easier to just never have it than to try to moderate it. I think moderation, not for everyone, but for an addict is a lie. Mm. And we would find it laughable if I would, you know, if I was a crack addict and I would say, okay, well, I'm only going to have crack on my birthday and I'm only going to have crack when I go to the movies. And um, I, so I'll have crack, but only a little bit. You know, maybe I'll just have one square of crack a day. You know, like I'm yeah. thinking about people that say, I just eat one square of chocolate a day or something like that. But the thing is, if you could do that, you would have done that. Yeah. If, that w if that was you, like, it's probably not you if you're 436 pounds. <laughs> yeah. It's probably not me, right? And so, so. Um, a clean abstinence is an easy abstinence. It's really easy for me to just say, mm -mm, that's nope, just completely off the table because it never gets in here. I never start thinking about it. Well, what if I just have a little bit? Well, what if, you know, and it's going to taste like this and I'm going to, oh, I remember the last time I had it and oh, remember that one place where I got that food. Then when you go there in your mind, it's like everything is created in your mind first. Yeah. Every, every relapse starts in your mind too, right? So if you go there in your mind, it's almost like you've already done it. You know, like how, I, 
I'm like in the Bible, it says like, if you've lusted after someone, then you've already kind of, you know, you're already done it in your heart or whatever. It's the same kind of thing. Like if you're already eating it in your brain, it's only a matter of time. until it's going to end up in your face. So I'm on guard for thoughts like that. I don't want those thoughts in my head. Um, and then I would just say, you know, what you have in your house is what you're going to eat. Be really, be really careful that you keep healthy food in your house, keep the junk out. If you have family members who don't eat like you, ask them to not eat it in front of you. And have enough love and respect for yourself that you feel like it's okay to say that. To say, you know, hey, I'm really trying this. It's I, I want to be around for you. I want to live a happy, healthy life. I've got these health problems. I'm really working on them. Could you support me? I know you love me. Could you support me by just having your pizza when you're not in the house, you know, go to the pizza parlor, don't have it in the house or have your, as much treats as you want at work, but please don't bring it home, you know, because as long as you're not trying to change them and you make it clear, Hey, I'm not trying to change you or I don't expect you to eat like me, but it would really help me if you could just not eat it in the house. Yeah. Yeah. That is some amazing advice and, and it's very practical so you know anybody can apply that you know today or tomorrow and and start making these changes so it's very encouraging and you know my kids have done it for me like they don't always eat like saints they my son likes good vegan junk food he's thin he's tall you know he was blessed with that but um they they are you know if people love you they will do that for you and you might be like oh i couldn't ask i couldn't ask people to do that for me but what do you have to lose you know and how has what you've been doing been working for you yeah so yeah, right. just try it yeah so where can people find you uh, you have a youtube channel i do it's called um it's a i wish i had the ability to go back in time and rename it but it's called the butterfly effect okay. and it's plant-based weight loss and um the reason i called it the butterfly effect is it's actually a meteorological meteorological weather phenomenon <laughs> um there was a movie where like even the flapping of a butterfly's wings could eventually end up in being a hurricane because it could it, it, it basically like small changes made very consistently can add up to big results. Mm -hmm. And so when I was feeling so stuck and like a prisoner in a 436 pound body, I felt like I can't do everything to make this better. I can't wave my magic wand and make this go away overnight, but I can take this small step. I can eat this way and I can go for this walk and I can write in my gratitude journal and I can make sure I get enough sleep and I can, you know, talk about my emotional problems instead of eating about them and little things like that and then having those small process goals where you're celebrating all along the way like i'm not trying to just get to a destination i'm all along the way i'm i'm achieving goals and then that builds your self-esteem and builds your credibility with yourself so it's all about being consistent you know and just losing i have taken off almost 300 pounds one pound at a time one pound a week, one, you know, lately more, but um, ever since I got really clean and gave everything to God, then it went a lot faster. <laughs> you know, funny how it works that way when you're eating extremely clean and making no exceptions that you, everything goes a lot faster. So, um, but yeah, so that's why I called it that. And then I also love the idea of a butterfly. When a butterfly changes, it goes all in. Like it literally like, you have to almost cocoon off. Like, I I think that's kind of true. Like, you don't, um, I didn't go to restaurants. I didn't go to a lot of parties and things like that. I kind of went into my safe space of, this is my safe space with my safe food because I am just a little caterpillar um, who's still, you know, learning how to do this. I'm new and green and trying to get this down. And so I kept, like, a safe space space for myself to become into a butterfly I think it works on a lot of levels there's a Janice Stanfield song that I just love and one of the lines says um, butterflies remind us there's magic in every life and we can become what we dream of if fat furry worms can fly 
Nice. Wow. Well, thank you. This, honestly, this was an amazing interview. Um, you shared so much information that I know is going to help a lot of people. So I'm very thankful. And, and your story is so, um, it, it's a great example of, you know, have, have you seen that illustration where there's uh, one side shows what people think success looks like and it's a straight line? And then yeah. what success really looks like, and it's like all over the board. Yeah. <laughs> so that is so me. Yeah. That is so, I wish I was one of those people that like I know people. You know, they they were on a terrible, sad diet. So was I. They found out about being vegan. They went vegan. They did it perfectly. Their diet got better and better. Their weight went down and down. They feel better and they lived happily ever after. Amen. You know. Yeah. And, Bless them. I'm so happy for them. But that is not my story. And so I just, here's, here's to the imperfect ones. Here's to falling down a thousand times, getting up a thousand and one, you know, um, we, we can all, we can all get there. You can get there. Believe in yourself, believe in your dreams, get up every day and get back in there and try another day. Exactly. Well, thank you. Really appreciate your time, and guys, definitely go check out Heather's YouTube channel. I'll put a link in the description below, as well to your Facebook page. You have a Facebook group, right? Is yes, it a group? and that okay. one is called The Butterfly Effect Raw and Plant-Based Weight Loss. Okay, great. So yeah, definitely go check out her resources, guys. You'll learn a whole lot and get inspired to start living healthier. And thanks again for joining us, guys. We will see you next time. And always remember to follow your raw intuition. Detoxify your mind and body. Be the change you want to see. Small steps towards living better steps to where I want to be.